flying to Luxembourg uh, for this new session of Les Midi de la Microfinance. I'm very happy to see so many people still interested in this very fascinating topic. As you know, Bank de Luxembourg has been supporting EDA since the launch of uh, the Midi de la Microfinance over 10 years ago. And well, we support uh, this conference cycle in the context of our uh, corporate social responsibility, uh, responsibility policy. Um, and well, BLI, uh, Bank de Luxembourg is an active promoter of uh, philanthropy, social ent entrepreneurship, and impact investing in Luxembourg. Well, maybe. One word about myself, my name is Thierry Falcon. I am head of product management at BLI, subsidiary of Bank de Luxembourg, and I had the chance of kickstarting the ESG project at BLI after we signed the UNPRI uh, in uh, July 2017. When we started digging into this, well, epic subject, I could say, um, we very quickly realized that concept that looked very clear cut from the outside <laughs> looked more and more fuzzy as you went along. So, um, and even they were highly controversial. So um, we took a step back and we tried to explain to the outside world what BLI is thinking about ESG. So let me share a few words about that with you. One of the most fuzzy concepts I came along was ESG. So uh, everybody has a concept about, about ESG, but there is no consensus at all. So. Um, when is it possible to say that investment strategy is ESG? Well, I might disappoint you. There is no point in time where you can say, from here on, I am ESG. It's more a mindset. It's a process and not a status. So for, for us, ESG type investments are a concept where an investment manager evaluates the behavior of companies with an E, environmental, S, social, and G governance mindset. It's not judged, it's just taken into consideration in the whole decision making process. And well, as you might know, portfolio managers are not just number crunchers looking at financial numbers and then deciding who is the most, well, uh, give, will give the most gains. Well, they're looking at things, how a company behaves. So everybody is in some way ESG. And as soon as it's structured with the E, S, and G mindset, you are ESG. The next step, well, I might say of confusion, is SRI, socially responsible investment. You, you, you take the whole thing a step further, so, and you add the dimension of responsibility and social. So in this concept, you judge what the companies do, and you exclude companies who don't do the things you think are right. And it's very, again, very um, subjective. Um, very often you see exclusion <coughs> lists of excluding companies uh, investing in tobacco, alcohol, and weapons, or uh, well, seeking best-in-class investments. Let me give you two examples. Ethical investing is in this category. Green investing is in this category. But the direct effects of these two approaches, SRI and ESG, are very, well, indirect on, on the ground. You cannot have an impact. <coughs> this is where the impact investing comes in. According to the GIN, Global Impact Investing Network definition, an impact investment is an investment that is made with the intention to generate a positive, measurable impact in terms of environmental or social on the ground alongside a financial return. Well, here you see finance gets on eye level with, uh, with the impact the non-financial non -financial gets on a high level with the, in, with, with the financial dimension. And sometimes you can even say finance is taking the back seat uh, in this whole concept. Well, this brings us to microfinance. Microfinance is impact investing as such. Investments are made with the intention of generating an impact. And well, you get a financial return, sometimes not, but <coughs> the objective is to generate an, uh, an effect. Well. Without further ado, I clear this, uh, the, the scene and head over to the speakers, and I look forward to the fascinating conference. Thank you very much. Thank you for that welcome and for the introduction. Um, my name is Micah Reinch, and I'm a consultant to ADA, and I'm very honored to be here today with my colleagues. Um, we're going to be having a conversation about three very timely topics in, in inclusive finance. 
And I have here on the stage Maji Sok, who is from Women's Investment Club in Senegal and also a partner at Dahlberg. I also am joined by Arnaud de la Lavalette, Senior Project Manager at ADA and head of, of ADA's digital, financial, uh, di digital Finance Initiative. And our, also Gerhard Kutzi, um, who is leading, who's leading the customer value team at CGAP. And one of the things that brings the four of us together this week is launching the planning for the Semaine Africaine de la Microfinance, the SAM, the African Week of Microfinance, which this will be ADA's fourth SAM that will be held in Ouagadougou this year and also co coincides with the 25th anniversary of ADA. And so we've been talking a lot about these three topics, um, digitalization, small and medium enterprises and entrepreneurship, particularly for women and youth, and um, the value for the customer. And we've been talking about those in the larger sense uh, for the sector, but also with an eye on, on Africa specifically. And as we look towards uh, achieving the social development goals, the SDGs by 2030, it's clear that in Africa, we've made great strides in the inclusive finance sector with um, the rise of mobile money, Africa's leading the way in that, um, innovations in rural finance, and cross-sectoral partnerships that are really making a difference and um, paving the way towards more and more inclusive finance. But at the same time, there are so many challenges that remain. Um, the rapidly growing population and efforts to keep pace with that, climate change, of course, with shortages and unrest and migration that results, um, and stagnant or even rising youth unemployment across the continent, and this persistent <coughs> exclusion of women. And so, in short, there's, a, there's still a lot to be done. And I think as part of this MIDI, um, when you all signed up, we asked everyone to say, of these three topics, uh, which is really the most important going forward in the coming years for inclusive finance. And the winner um, was digitalization. So I think with that, um, I'd like to talk, start with that theme. And um, I'm going to ask Arnaud to, to tell us a little bit about this fintech excitement. The financial technology is really gaining steam um, across the inclusive finance sector. Um, we're seeing its potential to reduce transaction costs and um, to achieve scale more efficiently. But in your role leading ADA's digital finance initiative, tell us what you're seeing with regard to digital technology and digital banking. Okay, thank you, <coughs> uh, Mika, for, for this introduction. Um, the the the, uh, the idea is, of course, not during the, the time we have to to uh, cover or to mention uh, the the very large scope of services that are uh, under the the, the title uh, digitalization. But to put it simply, I would say digitalization, uh, as regards to microfinance and uh, inclusion, is addressing essentially uh, two uh, two topics. Uh, number one, it's um, how do you improve existing services? Um, and number two is how do you extend the range of services? <coughs> the, the first one, how do you improve existing services, is, is uh, are really the, the, the challenges today. Uh, new services are maybe the challenges of tomorrow. Uh, <coughs> but uh, uh, trying to... Uh, articulate the link between um, inclusion and uh, digitalization, I checked what was the definition of inclusion. And these are the, the criteria that, that are mentioned. Number one, it's universal access. Um, here we are talking about two different challenges. Uh, we are talking about reaching people in remote areas, essentially rural areas. Uh, and we are talking about reaching the very poor because uh, serving people with services and credits in particular at 50 euros request uh, is uh, you, are, you are facing challenges that are significantly 
um, 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 more important than uh, providing credits at 500 or 5,000 euros. Uh, and that's where technology can help. <coughs> uh, in terms of reaching more people uh, in uh, rural and remote areas, it's essentially uh, what can you do with the mobile technology. Uh, when you talk about um, uh, reducing, uh, reaching uh, poor people or very poor people, uh, you are raising the question of the cost, which is how do you reduce your operational cost so that you can do it in a sustainable way. Uh, so the second criteria was the right range of services. That's uh, what I, the, the, second, uh, the second issue or topic I was mentioning. Um, Today we have, uh, and, and Gerard will uh, probably mention it, we have a boom of the e-money services, but finance uh, uh, inclusion, uh, financial inclusion does, should not be limited to this. It should also include remittance, insurance, uh, payments, etc., and access. So, and that's rather the, 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 world for the challenges for tomorrow. Um, the, the next criteria is different providers. Uh, the question is how do we increase um, uh, the, the outreach of the existing MFIs? Uh, and uh, because we can see on the field that there are many situations where you have a sort of monopoly of uh, local providers or national providers, and the risk would be to uh, have these uh, local uh, small providers disappearing of the, la of the, uh, the disappearing so that uh, the, the if that would hamper inclusion. Uh, I, I mentioned the, 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 costs, the cost question. I already mentioned it. I will not re revert to it. But it's really about how can technology help you do things, the same things but uh, more efficiently. And uh, the last one is maybe uh, 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 one of the more most important is the convenience. Uh, it's, it's nice to develop new services, it's nice to enroll new people, but uh, what if at the end of the day they don't use the services? So <coughs> um, the technology is there to, f to improve the, the client experience. Um, and this is, how we s we this is how we can just articulate or justify the link uh, between inclusion and digitalization. Um, now, uh, <coughs> as, a, as a final word to, to, to wrap up things, I would just say uh, um, we have seen improvements in terms of uh, financial inclusion thanks to e-money. Uh, the, 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 the new challenges that, are, that will happen are how do uh, microfinance institutions and uh, sort of small rural banks, etc., local actors uh, come in and adopt new technologies so that they can also uh, uh, offer their own services and compete with uh, bigger MNO, bigger players like MNOs and uh, telcos, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. So um, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to build on what you're you're talking about in terms of. Um, what people are actually experiencing, whether more MFIs are able to reach out to more customers and what those customers are able to access. By turning to you, Maji, and um, I know that as president of Women's Investment Club in Senegal, you see firsthand what entrepreneurs are experiencing, these small and medium enterprises, um, what they're able to access, and how perhaps digital technology and other innovations are affecting their access. So I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit about that, and particularly with regard to women and youth, these underserved populations. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, be before I get to the small and medium enterprises, perhaps to insist on the need to continue to look for solutions based on the, the, in the digital space. Um, we did a study in Senegal uh, a couple of years ago, uh, and we saw that there's still some differences, gender differences, uh, and obviously related to youth, but between women and men, for example, uh, there's a 15 percentage point on ownership of a phone, uh, so there's still some work to do there. Uh, in Senegal, the literacy rate for women, for the sample we worked with, was about 44%. Uh, so it means there are also some specific platforms and tools. Uh, there's a lot of progress, but more to be done. 
Uh, and it means to, um, in 2017, for the sample again, we had a difference of about uh, 11% uh, for ownership of a bank account or a mobile money account, 11% uh, lower for women. Uh, so I think despite all the progress that's been made, uh, we should still continue to look at uh, technology. Uh, one other very interesting statistics we had for Senegal was that about 40% uh, of the women we spoke to were comfortable having to ask their um, uh, spouse to uh, leave the house, uh, meaning we can't have all the brick and mortar. If it's there, they can't necessarily go to it. Uh, so technology, I think, is quite an important um, uh, platform to be able to bridge these gaps. Uh, but on the small and medium enterprise space, we've seen uh, microfinance do an incredible job around bringing uh, women and youth into the financial inclusion space and access to finance. Um, however, uh, there, there's uh, now a lot of uh, micro enterprises who have more ambition uh, and want to grow these businesses. And what we're finding is that in the spaces beyond, so if you want to give higher loans, uh, first we all know women have a difficult time accessing uh, bank loans for various reasons that we won't go into here. Uh, but we also saw that we can learn from what microfinance institutions have done uh, in terms of taking into consideration the specific aspects or environment of a woman or a young person. Uh, whether it's integrating the life cycle, what do I need, uh, or what kind of funds do I need, and when. Uh, for example, in Senegal, uh, some of the family ceremonies are so essential to the life of a woman that that's when she needs the funds. Or around um, lending or borrowing as a group. Uh, you've all heard about the Tontine system, which is very, very successful in Africa. How do we apply that? Uh, to other types of funding mechanisms, learning how microfinance was able to do that. Uh, so the Women's Investment Club is aiming to do that. We set it up in Senegal um, two years ago. We have 80 members now, women. So that is to say that, uh, again, when you bring women as groups, in a group, there's a lot of willingness to pull their money together, which is what we're trying to do, and invest in uh, small enterprises and startups uh, for women in Senegal. Uh, the challenges we face are the ones we hope uh, to learn from the journey of microfinance institutions around the legal and regulatory environment. How do you set up uh, venture capital or angel investing structures uh, that, are, that are coming from a, a group of women? Uh, how do you make sure that the, the life cycle, again, of a woman or, or a young person is taken into account in, within these financing mechanisms? Uh, so these are some of the challenges that we've faced in setting up the Women's Investment Club. Uh, uh, an interesting journey, and thanks to the support of ADA in this process, uh, we will be making our first uh, investments, uh, equity and loan, into uh, small and medium enterprises that are started by women in Senegal. And we've seen the model be replicated in Côte d'Ivoire, and we're hoping very soon in Guinea as well. Thanks, Maji. So it's, it's really interesting to hear about the value that you, you find that women have place in, um, in the group services. And it's an example of something that's a unique demand or, or something that's uniquely appreciated perhaps by certain groups. And so I'd, I'd like to turn to you, Gerhard, and, and ask you from the customer value perspective, um, you're leading this team at CGAP that's looking at these questions. Um, you know, if we want to really make serious progress towards the social development goals, we need to make sure that not only are we innovating and developing, uh, developing these products that reach people, but are they truly having value for people? Are, are there results? What are you seeing in terms of the results that are being achieved and the value that's really being offered to customers on the ground? Thank you, uh, Micah. Before we get to this question, I just have to clarify a few things. So firstly, it, it says USA behind my name, but I'm actually from South Africa, just <laughs> to make sure. And since I'm from South Africa, I don't trust um, uh, elections or votes. So this survey that you did, <laughs> I just don't trust it. <laughs> but, but coming to the aspect of value, um, I think it's important to start with a couple of numbers and then just explain uh, what we mean with financial inclusion 
and then get to customer value. So the first thing of importance to note is that two in 2006, three billion people across the world were excluded from formal financial services. But in 2017, only 1.7 billion were excluded. So we did a tremendous job across the world with partnerships throughout this room and in many other rooms uh, in terms of nearly halving the access challenge. <coughs> but access is only one small portion of inclusion. Uh, if you have access and you don't use, it's rather meaningless uh, for the customer and for the financial service provider, whoever you are. Um, we, um, we find that um, of the 1.2 billion accounts we opened over the 2011-2017 period, and just just a little bit of a segue, because we are so digital orientated, we forget that only 150 million of those accounts were digital accounts. The rest are all mm -hmm. bank accounts, microfinance accounts, cooperative banks, all of those. So it's very important to understand that we are at the beginning of a trend with digital. We are not at the end uh, of it, or in the middle even. But coming back to um, to this concept of use of that 1.2 billion accounts, um, the the mobile accounts are used, or 67 percent of it are used less than once in 90 days. Less than once in 90 days. So you build a business model on that. I dare you. Okay. The bank accounts, 20 percent of them, are dormant the day they are opened, and the majority of them are used as what we call mailbox accounts. The money comes in and it goes out as cash once a month, right? Or once in a period. So without use, you can't make this business case for financial inclusion work. So why are people not using it? Because they don't see value in it. What kind of value do they want to see in it? Well, firstly, they want functional value. They want to understand it if Micah uh, ga uh, gave me a remittance service, sent money, Gerard sent money to your grandmother, that I will easily be able to do it, the money will arrive at my grandmother and she will be able to get the money uh, without any problems. Functionally, it must work. What you promise must happen. <laughs> but there's another very important driver of value and that is experiential value. If my experience is negative, I'm not going to use it again. <laughs> If I feel disempowered by it, I'm not going to use it again. <laughs> if I feel empowered by it, if I feel I'm building up skills, I am understanding something new, I'm actually learning and I can use it again, then I will use it. And this is the big problem because the big problem is that we tend to forget the real needs of customers and we don't design it to actually fit their purpose. So, uh, so that's customer value. And if customer value doesn't translate to use, then there's no value for the firm. But I also want to say something a little bit in closure about um, uh, the, the things that can destroy value. Because we are focusing positively on things that can uh, construct and build value. But let's think about things that can destroy value, especially in digital. Uh, I can be excluded because I'm illiterate and innumerate. I can be excluded because I'm a rural woman that don't have access to a device, to a mobile phone device, <laughs> or that the norms of society or the way the men treat me in the family doesn't give me access to that device. So, uh, so we are very excited about the power of digital, but as a customer value person, I have to also uh, do a word of warning around that what we call the digital divide. Let's not build this digital so powerful that it actually pushes some people towards more exclusion. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I'll try and answer a question and end on a more positive note. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Gerhard. Um, well, let's, let's take this a little bit further in thinking about um, the, the roles that various partners and players can, can play in um, making sure that this fintech movement serves the customer. Um, what, what would you say, uh, you, you, you spoke earlier, Arnaud, about um, 
MFI readiness. You touched on the need for MFIs to be ready for this movement, to prepare themselves. What, what are the various roles that fintech companies and MFIs can play to make sure that we are delivering customer value and uh, fulfilling the promise of these, of these initiatives? And that's really directed to all three of you. Well, <coughs> it's, it's really about uh, putting yourself in the boots of your own clients. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, many MFIs do it, and they do it uh, on a daily basis. Uh, but they do not necessarily connect the dots with uh, what it means or what it implies in terms of digitalization. Uh, meaning, okay, if you use uh, new technologies, what is it for? Not generally, but concretely for your customers. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and what does that mean also in terms of adaptation of your own processes, uh, your own organization as a, as a business structure? Mm -hmm. So that you uh, you are not only having the tools, but you also have the staff uh, being able to use them efficiently, and uh, uh, so that you really deliver uh, added value. Uh, and this is something on which uh, Ada, the Ada Digital Finance Initiative is really focusing on. Uh, it's uh, okay. What do you uh, what do you intend to to offer to your clients? Uh, what it will be their customer journey? What will be the customer journey? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I would, uh, I would add to that, uh, making sure all the right players are around the table, uh, the regulator, um, so making sure that everybody's playing fair uh, and that fintechs do have actually access to be able to develop the products and, and services, uh, and uh, really ensuring that... Um, uh, the private sector is also around the table. Uh, we In West Africa, we have a, a central bank that has a lot of say uh, in some of these aspects, uh, making sure there's interoperability between the different uh, partnerships. So I think it's really looking at the full ecosystem and making sure everybody's around the table and doing their part mm -hmm. uh, to, to make the, the changes. But mm -hmm. You've used an interesting word there in partnerships, and I think... Um, our experience across the world is where digitization and building access to digital service really uh, seems the most successful. It is where you have big partnerships between mobile network operators, banks, MFIs. And MFIs have a specific advantage that actually can make them a compelling partner in a digitization project. Uh, and that is because they are so in touch with their clients. They are so near to their clients. And I'm not generalizing, say, all MFIs understand their clients. But in general, we find that especially those that are also thinking about the social mission uh, really try to understand their clients and design accordingly and deliver accordingly. And that is a great advantage in a partnership with the external, quote, unquote, mobile network <laughs> operator or big bank from the city, uh, etc. So there's, uh, there's a, a, a great call that we should leverage that mm -hmm. uh, much more. There is also something that is changed uh, in terms of partnership. That's the geography of, of pot potential or possible mm -hmm. partnerships. Digitalization allows you to work with a technical partner who is 10,000 kilometers away from where you are operating. Mm -hmm. And this is something totally new. The, 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 the f formerly, uh, providers were local providers, having local <laughs> technologies, I mean, being less challenged uh, in terms of competition, etc. Digitalization is also uh, redistributing uh, uh, the, the, the roles and, uh, and the challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I'd like to I'd like to go a little bit deeper in terms of um, the gender gap, which you have all touched on. Um, and we were talking earlier about this statistic that in certain countries, including in Senegal, um, there there's a, there's not a mobile there, there's a mobile money. Um, a growth of mobile money accounts, but not a gender gap in terms of mobile money, whereas we see that with traditional microfinance. And so, you know, I wonder, does that, does that bode well for fintech? Does that bode well for, micro, for mobile money? Are we going to see a, a tipping point that way? Or um, what's going on with that, with that gender gap? And 
If not, what are some strategies for addressing this gender gap so that we make sure that people aren't left behind um, as a result of progress and innovation? Mm -hmm. Oh, we're, we're going to take over. There's no... <laughs> <laughs> Listen, in Senegal, we're going to take over. <laughs> no doubt about that. Uh, so gr great to see these numbers showing that women are, are getting more involved. Uh, for us, there's something about uh, engaging women in the full uh, spectrum of financial services, both as a beneficiary, but also as an investor, uh, looking at the broad range of uh, 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 opportunities that exist in, in, in capital markets, learning from other countries' uh, examples. So I think it's taking a very holistic view on how uh, women and young people engage uh, in, the, in access to finance or the financial inclusion uh, space. Uh, that's one, one uh, first, uh, first step, but also... <coughs> Uh, realizing the entire life cycle of an enterprise and how do we engage uh, throughout. Uh, so, you know, women and young people do see that financial services is, is a very long-term uh, relationship that one has. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think um, there are, uh, from work at CGAP, building on what you've said, there are three areas that are of importance here. Because we do have a 9% gap internationally in developing countries be between women's access and men's access. And uh, one of the most powerful drivers is something I mentioned earlier, is sort of social norms or cultural norms that, that uh, uh, sort of uh, dictate uh, access. Uh, and that's something that you have to work on. That it's not easy to work on it, but the digital solution is actually one of the methods that you can work on that because uh, whereas you have to get permission to, <laughs> to go to the bank branch, you don't need permission to use your phone to check your balance, etc. So, uh, so by using technology, you can actually break some of those norms over time, uh, the way you design stuff. It's also extremely important to think about women in technology uh, because if you don't have access to a mobile phone, you don't get the skills and both the sort of understanding of how to use it and where we can provide more access uh, by breaking down some of these norms, we will see <coughs> what happened, uh, what's happening in Senegal. We will see those kind of things. Uh, sometimes it's shaded as well. Sometimes like Iran has uh, about no gap between men and women's access to uh, digital services. Mm -hmm. But it is because uh, the government uh, launched a massive payments program for women, and that sort of pushed up the numbers. Uh, whether anything else changed to do that, we don't know. Yeah. Well, um, maybe with that, um, I'd, I'd like to open up the, the floor to all of you, and I'm sure there are some questions out there. Uh, we'd like to hear from you. and. Um, there's a microphone coming around, so.
Thank you. So um, the first question is about the underlying <coughs> infrastructure and the investment opportunity there um, to increase the, the uh, affordability of data as well, um, as well as the reach of coverage. And the second one is about new faces, new voices. That I saw, saw you nodding, Maggie. Yes. Perhaps. So I'll let you all. Well, react. regarding the, the question of investments uh, in infrastructures, I would say that the situation is very different from a country to another, uh, a, a dramatically different, even if they are neighbors. Um, <coughs> but globally, uh, and we also, this is also a question that we address when we are uh, dealing with MFIs, of course, because that's the, it's a prerequisite for having a, a centralized system. Um, but uh, investments are there, obviously, already. Uh, MNOs are investing massively, and uh, I'm always surprised to see the quality of the connectivity, even in the most remote places uh, of uh, West Africa, at least. Uh, which is, which was supposed to be uh, uh, ten years back from the eastern part of Africa. Uh, even in West Africa, the quality of the connectivity is is, is more than decent, mm -hmm. and certainly sufficient for uh, microfinance institutions to to operate uh, in a digital environment. Uh, and at, I would even say at an affordable. I, I mean, I, I was thinking of Senegal at an affordable uh, rate. So the question of uh, other countries in West Africa, uh, the, the costs are, are dropping rapidly as soon as you have the investments and you have competition, costs are, are, are decreasing rapidly. Uh, so uh, it's, really rather, it's a positive <laughs> message I would like to send, it's, it's coming, if, mm. if not already there. So I, I, before we get to, to you, Faces, new voices. Uh, uh, Catherine, you're right. Um, South Africa is a little bit behind in terms of really going down to this sort of decrease in rates due to good competition, but it's happening. Uh, I <coughs> saw some recent reports in Southern Africa. We're also getting more speed and less cost at the moment, but it's, uh, it's, it's extremely important to invest. Uh, I know Madagascar invested heavily in uh, access uh, and speed of their lines. And they have built one of the biggest uh, business outsourcing sort of services in Africa in a very short time because of that available infrastructure. So, uh, so yes, it is something that one should uh, invest in. It's also interesting to see far more and more coherent policies between financial and telecoms policies happening. Uh, we've looked at Kenya. Sometimes you get a little bit of a hiccup, like they had with the interest rate cap recently. But overall, these policies are coming together. The bankers are speaking to the telecoms people and, uh, and the other way around. Uh, so uh, so I, I, it is a, a challenge, but we see good trends uh, in that regard across the continent. Uh, I'll just add to that. I, I do believe that government still has a role to mm. play in building. You know, the same way we think about public-private partnerships when we're building highways and uh, you know power plants or whatever it is. Uh, but there should be also a role for public-private partnerships as we think about financial inclusion and particularly the uh, particularly the infrastructure that comes with it. I think India is building some interesting models that uh, would be good for the, the rest of the world and particularly African countries to learn from. Um, not easy to convince, but something that needs to be done. Um, on the yes, we, we, we actually the person who leads the new voices, new voices, new or new faces, new voices in um, in Africa is a member of the Women's Investment Club. But what's interesting is the Grassama Shell Trust has just started a, a fund to support. Fund women fund managers in Africa, working with the Economic Commission for Africa. Uh, but they found that it's very much looking at the higher ticket items. Uh, so how do you deal with the Women's Investment Club, for example, where we're looking for an average of 50,000 US dollars in loans? Uh, and this is where I say it's this, everything needs to be built and thought about. Uh, and they've been wanting to be flexible and think about new models with us. I think that's the next frontier. <laughs> and glad to see uh, a lot of organizations are thinking how to <coughs> adapt to address that, that uh, missing middle, as we call it. Thank you. What other questions are out there? My name, 
My name is Peter Eiben from the EMDA Development Organization. I didn't hear much uh, involvement on NGOs and local NGOs and uh, local cooperatives. Could I get some comment on that, please? Yeah, we've, we, we've been talking quite a bit about the importance of partnerships and, and also cooperatives and um, doing one-to-many, having one-to-many opportunities in order to increase outreach. Would any of you like to comment on that? No, I, I can just quickly sort of run through some numbers that may help. And I define uh, cooperatives uh, quite broadly in terms of member-based uh, institutions. So Africa is probably the continent with the highest number of people participating in savings groups uh, internationally. I think it's now up to 14 million people in these groups from down from Niger right to Southern Africa, Senegal, all over. <coughs> we, see, um, we see an interesting phenomena where these groups get uh, far more digitized um, using uh, uh, sort of the services of fintechs to decrease their internal cost as well. So just to link the digital and the groups. Uh, we see large uh, savings and credit cooperatives uh, uh, working in the agricultural industry in Kenya, in Uganda, places like that. They also uh, sort of go the digital way. Um, in Ivory Coast uh, with uh, uh, cocoa growers cooperatives uh, using the power of that sort of collective action to uh, to link people to market. So, so there is a great movement across the continent in terms of that. But you, you know what the reality is, is that even though it is such a powerful movement, we still need a lot of work in building capacity in those institutions to actually access these services to, uh, to leverage the power of uh, technology. And sometimes it go wrong as well. Uh, we've seen one or two uh, situations where these groups collapsed uh, because of uh, uh, the promise of technology and misuse of funds in, in the confusion of technology. But I think it's an important ingredient of the African landscape. Uh, the institutional typologies is definitely cooperatives, member-based institutions, group approaches, and going right down to the formal. You mentioned it, Tontines, earlier today. Uh, uh, sort of, uh, we see that phenomena across the continent. If I may just add one point, uh, uh, the yes, the NGOs are critical, but also the the opportunity is, uh, I, I guess, so tangible that we're moving into some of these services are becoming very commercial, uh, and governments are seeing that. Uh, so from some models that were author authorized in terms of uh, financial products and services, the yeah, for example, investment clubs, we're seeing also a tendency to say these have to be uh, a commercial entity uh, that is, um, uh, you know, paying certain taxes. Uh, so I think there has to be more advocacy to ensure that uh, uh, some of these institutions can remain <coughs> NGOs uh, before they're pushed too fast into the commercial space. The opportunity is real. Uh, people are seeing these things uh, create a lot of value. Um, so I think also it's a, a bit of uh, work we need to we need to do. More questions? Thank you. Uh, I'm Aurelia Dabougan from Agra, uh, Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, and I'm really excited with what I'm hearing there. Just I, I would like to hear more about what would be the interest for a financial service pro pro uh, provider to become client-centric? Because I think that wi with this concept, the, the profitability, the normal way of the profitability is shifting from traditional revenue coming from the product sales, market sales, is shifting now to the profitability of the client. And I'm sure it will help you, you increase the demand in the client. But when we look at those operating in rural area, <coughs> in agri specifically, where the client margin are really, <coughs> is not that much enough. So is there some business cases for those financial service providers to become really client-centric? So mm. thank you. So uh, since I'm 
with customer <laughs> centricity guy, I have to face that one. Um, and I'll start really uh, with uh, one or two case studies internationally, and then I'll come to Africa. And I'll try to be very quick because I see we are getting close to the end of the hour. But um, um, firstly, uh, we have uh, very nice case studies on a website that is customersguide.cgap.org. <laughs> customersguide.cgap.org. You just go there to the first tag and you say case studies and you have a look there. And one of those case studies is a fascinating case study about what happens when you really understand your customers. And I'm speaking Haiti, post-earthquake 2010, people started mobile money payments. By 2015, the biggest mobile money payments uh, and mobile money provider uh, in Haiti only had 40,000 active clients after five years of struggle. So they went to their customers and they said, oh, you know, let's try and understand what's going on here. First thing they realized is they confused people with too many things on their phone and they gave them one service, remittances. Second thing they did is they said, we must be more efficient, so we price at break even from now, now and then our efficiency will give us our profit. Mm -hmm. So we are forced to do that. And the third thing they did is they changed the whole agent structure. Two years, 40,000 people to 807,000, sorry, active customers in two years, just because they went to the trouble to start speaking to customers to find out what they can do, how they can service, how, how can they take him on a customer journey that makes sense for them, that sort of... Uh, and look at the value that they bought. So that's an example. Now, in, in, in Africa and in agriculture, we see a lot of large firms, Ulam, big a agricultural agency across the world. We see Syngenta, big firms, are really interested in uh, digital platforms and digital reach because that brings down the cost of that small provider. And we see successful programs in several countries already. <laughs> but the fascinating thing is that Service providers, financial service providers, now see those platforms working and they say, well, how can we get on that platform to use the same platform to provide what you provide for providing inputs and advisory services to provide financial services? And we love that. We love to see how these worlds come together, the agricultural world and the financial world, and solve things and bring down costs and go further down the ladder the poverty ladder to the more poorer farmers. That's the kind of things we want to see, and we do see it. We do see it. I'm not a client century city specialist, <laughs> as Joe is, but uh, I would just give you another example. Uh, in one of our fir very first workshops, uh, I asked them uh, bluntly, okay, why are you here? And they say, well, and, and many of them, they answered, uh, because our clients are asking things we are not doing today and which are provided by uh, other mm -hmm. uh, operators, in, in this case, telcos. Uh, so th that is forcing MFIs also to, to reconsider the way they work mm -hmm. and to be client-centric. <coughs> Do we have time for one more question? A short one. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Issa. Uh, I'm, I'm also from Senegal. I happen to be here because I'm doing an assignment, a short-term assignment for ADA. Uh, I've, I'm fortunate to have seen the evolution of, of microfinance in Africa over the past 20 years, uh, from microfinance to the so-called financial inclusions, etc. Uh, there's been a lot of changes, uh, challenges, of course, but changes as well. Positive, negative. Uh, the, uh, in 2017, I did an assignment for the African Union regarding the digital dividend. And uh, today I'm asking myself, if you look at uh, this uh, digital finance issue, you see, uh, okay, in Africa, most country, in most countries, people have mobile phones, smartphones, fantastic ones. <coughs> They do. They can do transactions with those these phones. Uh, there are platforms. Um, we still have issues with the you know, interoperability in many countries. We still have issues with the access of broadband, etc. But uh, beyond 
uh, this uh, sending money, receiving money transactions. Beyond that, is there something that digital finance has been able to achieve in terms of, let's say, SME access to finance? If not so, what would be the prerequisite to get into that? So you mean beyond, you said beyond transactions, what would be the pre prerequisite to, um, to expand <coughs> inclusive finance through digital means? Well, inclusive finance is not only about accessing, uh, I mean doing transactions like getting money, receiving money, which is uh, most common use of mm -hmm. digital finance so far in Africa. We, we, ha we want to go beyond that, uh, accessing finance through <coughs> you know, an SME uh, would be interested in investment financing, mm -hmm. uh, working capital financing. How do we go into that using the <coughs> financial technology? Yeah, okay. So how do we go beyond those simple transactions to really extend uh, financial inclusion? Shall I? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> by um, by integrate integrating the service into the lives of people. Let me give you several examples, uh, Issa, because I do not entirely agree with you We're only on uh, on remittances or, or sent and receive. We see a massive explosion of digital credit uh, uh, in East Eastern Africa. We see um, a massive growth of uh, uh, using digital finance to finance energy, off-grid energy uh, in many countries. Uh, we see it going slowly into uh, financing of education, uh, uh, health, health insurance, so th those things are <coughs> growing and it's because people started to ask, why are we looking at digital finance? Because we must go beyond this sort of uh, shiny thing called digital or mobile. We must think about how do we use technology to actually serve people's needs. Uh, so the, the story is still a financial story. Technology is just here a leverage on the side that actually facilitate that and we see it going <coughs> far deeper into people's lives. And and you are right, yes, the question is, <laughs> how can we leverage this and how can we scale it? And my answer is exactly the same as I've answered twice now, is to understand customers at the granular level and to build products and services that fit their lives and not the lives of the providers. Uh, <coughs> if we think much more in that direction, we'll find far better solutions and that is, this is what happened when the energy finance, the off-grid energy finance started sort of growing, because I, uh, a lot of you probably uh, know it far better than I do, but what they do now with uh, off-grid energy is they even use that um, uh, system to finance other items for households once they've paid off their off-grid sets, etc. So I think we are standing in front of a revolution, but we must watch out for this revolution because digital credit, for example, uh, is a very sort of quick thing. You few seconds on your phone and then you are there. And, um, and the problem is you can be there too quickly. So uh, in Tanzania and Kenya, we have these challenges, as I mentioned, uh, you know, 40% more people late on loans, 20% uh, of people don't repay. And we have to watch out for that uh, so that we don't lead our customers uh, on the wrong journey. And we were talking yesterday a little bit about non-financial services that are also mm -hmm. being delivered and some innovations us using di digital technology to enhance agricultural um, efforts and, and others, health and, and other connections with, with sectors where it can in enhance um, financial inclusion because it enables people to improve their, their revenues and, and their health. Uh, and I'll just add, I, I see it as a, a just a huge uh, opportunity space. Uh, and it's been very exciting in uh, many countries to see how incubators, accelerators, uh, all sorts of competitions to think about what are the expanded uses that we can uh, put out there uh, has created, uh, particularly for the youth, I think has created a, a lot of energy and an amazing, amazing uh, dynamic space. Uh, so I, to me, it's a huge, huge opportunity space. If I, if I may give a, a small, small uh, um, uh, tech flavor uh, to answer your question, I would say uh, one prerequisite for the div diversification of digital services are the core banking system of the providers. Mm. 
If, as long as you don't have a system that can dialogue with third-party providers to provide electricity, to purchase electricity, or to whatever, uh, uh, acquire inputs or whatever, uh, you will not be able to diversify your services, and this is today the main challenge uh, of microfinance institutions worldwide. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, thank you for all of the questions. And um, now we have a, for a conclusion, we have <coughs> Sachin Vankales from LuxFlag, who is going to wrap up this conversation. Welcome, Sachin. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, uh, Micah and all panelists for this very interesting presentation. Now, I'm aware that I'm standing between your lunch, and uh, so I, I will be very quick. What I'm going to do is just conclude or, or, or summarize for you what we heard so far. Huh? What we heard is basically financial inclusion in Africa is flourishing, it's growing, um, and, and digitalization has a very important role in that. When we say digitalization, um, just to throw some numbers, 21% of African adults today have access to mobile money. That's a that's an very important number. If you look particular countries like Kenya, 73% of adult population has somehow, in some way, uses digital financial services. That's again, very interesting number. Um, one of the one of the main um, main solution what digitalization has provided is of course access to finance. Uh, it it has somehow democratized the access of finance, because um, I, I imagine before digitalization, MFIs were not able to very much go into the fields where or remote areas or, or even. Uh, there was uh, also discussion about gender uh, gap or, or youth and women uh, population having access to finance, which was not necessarily the case when um, digitalization was not there. But then um, we also heard from Gerhard that um, uh, in along with this digitalization or democratization of uh, financial uh, inclusion, what we heard about digital divide that, um, okay, without naming country, we heard that uh, in, in one of the country, in, in, in a week's time, few million bank accounts were, 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 were opened. And after that, in, in a year's time, half of them are dormant accounts. So again, the question is, uh, do we need that? Uh, is it just a question of opening account? Or are we going to, uh, going to use those accounts? Or are we going to provide some kind of financial services to those clients? Now, question is also about, um, uh, because the client is, and there was a very interesting question, uh, last question, is uh, it's not only about providing financial services for, for starting a business or so, but uh, a client, let's imagine uh, I, I'm a young adult in Africa, or I have a family, so I need, of course, money for business, which digitalization would, would provide me, but I have a children also for whom I need, I, I, I need uh, let's say, finance his or her schooling. Then I, I have health problems. I have uh, education of my family. I need energy, clean energy, lamp, or, or, you know, uh, agriculture. All this, how can we somehow look at day-to-day -day needs of our clients uh, beyond just financing for their businesses. That's very important, and we have a very important tool for that, which is the SDGs. In SDGs, all of that is uh, extremely well covered. So how can financial institutions or financial inclusion increase its or, or widen its scope to broader let's say, uh, sustainable development goals where um, the day-to-day -day client needs would be, would be then in some way um, treated. So that's, that's something we have, to, uh, we have to look at. There was mention about partnership also because uh, with, with these new players like MNOs, mobile network operators, which are not necessarily financial institutions, they do not necessarily have all of them financial, um, let's say, services experience. So how, how are we building, uh, building uh, partnerships with those new players, with existing players? That's also something important. Again, policy uh, work need to be done. Regulators, this is something new for regulators. How can be money transferred without a contractual relationship? How, how, how are regulators uh, going to look at that? So all these questions need to be slowly dealt. Now, I, in the beginning, I mentioned that uh, uh, the financial inclusion in Africa in general is flourishing, 
but um, again, only public financing or financing through donor institutions, uh, development finance institutions, is not going to suffice. If we look at the population of Africa, if we look at the need and potential, what, uh, what the continent needs, it's huge. Um, just again, throwing some numbers, if we look at private capital coming from microfinance funds to Africa, uh, even the, 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 the potential is so huge, it's just about eight to 10% out of the 16, 17 billion US dollars which is invested by microfinance funds worldwide, just eight to 10% is Africa. Why is that? Because one of the main reasons which we hear for years and years is capacity building. African institutions, financial institutions, I'm not talking now about fintechs, but mainstream financial institutions, particularly MFIs, still need to do a lot of work in building their capacity so that they could be, they would be able to then, um, then, then have access to this international private capital also. So altogether, uh, to conclude, I suppose um, there is a huge work to be uh, done. Last but not least, very important question there also was about uh, what is the reason of these financial <laughs> players to go into clients? Huh? Uh, we, we, we learned that digitalization is helping um, or, or, or improving the operational efficiency so that we could reach to more and more client, meaning reducing the cost for these financial providers to go and offer loans or credits. But I haven't heard that because I, my MFI, or I am a fintech provider, and because I reduce the cost, I decrease the interest rates to my clients. I haven't heard that. So how, how, can, how can we do that? What, how can we transpose the benefits financial institutions are having because of digitalizations to the clients, value to the clients? And that's the work which we, of course, as investors, uh, which of course the Luxembourg community, uh, but also the financial service providers which are based in Africa, the DFIs, the regulators, all of us have a lot to do on that. But on a positive note, digitalization is very much helpful and it will further, um, further uh, let's say, extend uh, or the flourishment of financial inclusion sector in Africa, but in other continents also. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sachin, for that wrap-up and for that challenge. Um, I'd like to thank the Directorate for the Development Cooperation and Humanitarian Affairs, thank the Bank of Luxembourg, um, thank all of our speakers here today, um, thank also the Inclusive Finance uh, Network of Luxembourg, and all of you here today in the audience and online on ADA's website, thank you for being here, and let's continue the discussion over lunch. Thanks. Thank you.